funding for Treasuring Our Natural Heritage has been provided by the National Science Foundation. just a joy to be out in the warm sunshine on this beautiful fall day and looking at the colors, walking through the trees, listening to the sounds of the birds, the bugs. This is where I find joy and peace and solitude and my getaway from the rat race. Nancy Randall is a cancer survivor who is recovering from locally advanced breast cancer. Just to be alive has been incredibly emotional for me. Last summer I was very, very ill. And just to be here this year and being able to be out in the woods and to feel healthy and to be regaining my strength is, is gives me overwhelming gratitude. An important part of Nancy Randall's medical treatment was a cancer-fighting drug known as Taxol. Taxol is a natural substance, and it was discovered in the Pacific U, a type of conifer that grows in the Nez Perce National Forest of Northern Idaho, as well as in many other forests throughout the Pacific Northwest. Taxol is just one of thousands of pharmaceutical agents derived from plants that are used to treat a wide range of human diseases. And these medicines, for all their importance, constitute but a fraction of the benefits that humans derive from the natural world. At every moment of our lives, we are the recipients of nature's services. The food we eat, the fuels we burn, the water we drink, and the air we breathe are among the countless benefits we receive from nature. In fact, Virtually every aspect of the human economy rests on something more fundamental, what we might call the natural economy. This natural economy, with its vast array of biological processes and its astonishing diversity of plant and animal species, represents the living fabric of planetary life. Without the vital life support services provided by this natural web of commerce, human existence would not be possible. In this program, we will examine some of nature's most important services, as well as the biological diversity that sustains them. We'll take a fresh look at things we often take for granted, and in the process, we'll discover a host of natural wonders. We'll witness the remarkable ability of plants to capture energy from the sun, We'll see how microscopic organisms recycle waste materials and cleanse our waters. And we'll also learn about the value of natural substances in saving human lives. While there are several important life support services, None is more critical or more basic than photosynthesis. In fact, photosynthesis is what makes the Earth the living planet it is today. Photosynthesis is an incredible process. It is amazing that it evolved in the first place and scientists are still finding out the intricate details that really allows it to happen. Peter Raven is director of the Missouri Botanical Garden and a well-known authority on plants. Like many other botanists, he views photosynthesis as one of the greatest wonders of the natural world. Photosynthesis is the process by which green plants and algae and some bacteria are able to convert a small portion of the sun's energy which bombards the earth into chemical bonds inside their own bodies and by doing that, produce a source of energy that fuels their own life processes, and then indirectly the life processes of every other living thing on Earth, including ourselves. The sugars and starches created by photosynthesis become biomass in plants. 
And this biomass gives animal species a way of accessing the energy from the sun. Plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria, being the only organisms that can carry out photosynthesis, build up biomass that is living organic substance, and that living organic substance is what animals depend upon. But the importance of photosynthesis doesn't end with the conversion of solar energy into biomass. When plants photosynthesize, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and produce oxygen. This is the primary source of oxygen on Earth, and all oxygen-breathing organisms depend on it. The oxygen produced by photosynthesis is also the source of ozone in the upper atmosphere, and it is this ozone that shields living things against harmful types of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Scientists believe that it's been the evolution of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere and the formation of an ozone layer that's made possible the emergence of life onto the land to be present on the surface of the Earth and not to be so damaged by the radiation of ultraviolet B from the sun that they were simply unable to live there. Photosynthesis is all the more remarkable for the wide range of conditions under which it occurs. Photosynthesis is a marvelous process which makes possible life itself in the most inhospitable conceivable environments on the face of the earth. Even in the dry valleys of Antarctica where the temperatures rarely ever get above the freezing point, bacteria and some algae carry out the process of photosynthesis and power the simple life systems that exist in those really drastic environments. Pollination is another primary natural service. It brings plants and animals together in a remarkable symbiosis, a great dance of life. The animals need pollen and nectar as food resources, while the plants require help from animals to achieve fertilization. Like photosynthesis, this natural service is so basic that it is easy to overlook. And yet animal pollination is essential for a great many cultivated and native plants. Without animals transporting pollen from the plant's male to their female parts, those plants could not set seed or fruit and thus they could not reproduce. Most flowering plants require some kind of pollination, often from an animal, and bees are one of the best pollinators. There's a lot of wild flowers that wouldn't reproduce if there weren't pollinators, but in addition, agricultural crops often require pollination. In fact, it's been estimated that about a third of the food that we eat requires pollination at some level. Karen Strickler is a pollination ecologist who studies alfalfa leafcutter bees at the University of Idaho's Parma Research Station in western Idaho. She points out that pollination involves a highly specialized relationship between plant and animal. Biological diversity plays an important role because different shapes and sizes of flowers require different kinds of pollinators. Scarlet gilia, for example, needs a long-billed bird that can reach deep inside its trumpet, while the alfalfa plant needs an insect with just the right weight to trip the pollination mechanism hidden at the base of its flower. Pollination is a mutualistic interaction. The bee depends on the flowers, the flowers depend on the bees. In this case, the bee lands on the petals down at the bottom here, and if you imagine this toothpick is the tongue of a bee, it sticks its tongue down, presses down, and out comes a little column that has the anthers on it, the pollen, the male part of the plant. That's the tripping that goes on in a flower. Let me get another one. Boom. This is what the bee is doing when it pollinates the flower. The bee can collect the pollen off of here, and the flower gets pollinated in the process. In economic terms, the value of the services provided by pollinators is truly staggering. In the U.S. alone, more than 100 cash crops worth over $30 billion a year 
are pollinated by winged insects. This includes such important crops as tomatoes, cucumbers, apples, oranges, peaches, almonds, and of course, alfalfa seed. Ron Bittner is a pollination consultant who works with farmers in Idaho and across the American West. He describes the economic significance of a single pollinator, the alfalfa leafcutter bee. Each year here in Idaho, we grow about 35,000 acres of alfalfa for seed. On that 35,000 acres, the growers typically put 30 to 50,000 leafcutter bees per acre. So we're talking about millions of these little bees that pollinate this alfalfa seed each year. From there, this crop goes into the $5 billion a year alfalfa forage industry. That's the hay that's consumed by your beef cattle and by the dairy cows throughout Wisconsin, New York, Southern California, wherever. That's the multi-billion dollar industry that this little bee is responsible from these fields here in Idaho. The alfalfa leafcutter bee is but one of a number of bees now being studied at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Bee Laboratory in Logan, Utah. The research is considered urgent because of serious problems affecting the honeybee, which remains the primary pollinator in American agriculture. Domestic honeybee populations are declining nationwide, due in large part to diseases, but also because of the arrival of Africanized honeybees. Many scientists are concerned about the threat this poses to agriculture, and they believe there is a need to identify bees that can help maintain this vital natural service. Of the more than 3,000 native bees in the U.S., one species that is currently receiving much attention from researchers is the blue orchard bee. This particular bee has proven to be highly adept at pollinating apple, cherry, and almond trees, says William Kemp, the director of the bee lab. These crops that the blue orchard bee seems to be well suited to pollinate are Early, generally speaking, early crops in the orchard world. They, they tend to be things like cherries, which oftentimes flower in, during a period of time when weather is rather poor. The blue orchard bee, being a spring bee, is adapted to those kinds of conditions which may be rainy or cool, and they can take advantage of fairly small what we call pollination windows, or windows of opportunity to get out and get the job of pollination done. Yeah. I think you're just flying up there some right now. One cherry grower who decided to accept Kemp's invitation to try the Blue Orchard Bee was Chet Kendall. Did you see a bee? Kendall operates a three and a half acre orchard in North Ogden, Utah, at the foot of the towering Wasatch Mountains. Oh, any bees in there? He had been using honeybees to pollinate his cherry trees, but decided to make the switch because of concerns about safety. See, I've got the four little children, and with those four little kids, and the neighbors that are close, uh, I had complaints about people getting stung by the honeybees, especially when they're being pulled out. Uh, the people couldn't work in their yards. Uh, I actually had people who got stung, complaints, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what initially prompted me to call. Kendall wanted a non-aggressive bee, one that would pose no threat to his children or his neighbors. At the same time, he wanted a bee that would be an effective pollinator. He found both in the Blue Orchard Bee. For us, it's been very good because we have the children out playing. The children uh, watch the bees. They entertain the children. It's really quite a delightful situation. As we watched and tried to measure the amount of pollen they're transferring, it looks like they're doing a wonderful job. While Chet Kendall was impressed with the ability of the Blue Orchard Bee to transfer pollen, the acid test of its effectiveness as a pollinator would come at harvest time. As pickers began bringing in the cherry crop, Kendall watched the proceedings with great interest. Looking good. So, Chet, how did we do this year? <laughs> I've been going crazy. I've had to go over to my neighbors and borrow ladders. I've had to go borrow buckets. I've had to go get picking crates, extra picking crates. It's kept me scrambling, literally, uh, morning and night to keep up to them. The tree looks pretty good. This has always been a good tree, Mary. 
right now as we're looking at it, I'm almost three times where I would have been on the best year so far in the orchard. For me, it is unbelievable. Given what seems to be a pretty successful harvest this year, how do you feel about the use of the blue orchard bee in pollination of the orchard? To be honest, the blue orchard bee is the only thing of significance that I've done differently this year than the last eight to 10 years. So I've got to put the lion's portion, certainly of the success of this year, to the blue orchard bee. I would have been delighted to have just an equal year to the honeybee, but, right. but I'm finding out now that, that we can have higher expectations from the blue orchard bee. And as a small farmer, the blue orchard bee has helped me to make the transition of having this be a part-time operation to being a full-time productive farm on a small farm basis. It, to do it without the blue orchard bee would have been impossible for me. The blue orchard bee helped Chet Kendall increase his production from a previous record of 12,000 pounds of cherries to over 40,000 pounds. But achieving success with his orchard requires more than just effective pollination. Kendall is also the beneficiary of another important natural service, the maintenance of soil fertility. Beneath the surface of his orchard, a huge community of organisms is busy at work recycling organic matter and making it available to the cherry trees in the form of useful nutrients. Perhaps the best known inhabitants of the subterranean community are earthworms. What is less well known, however, is the important role they play in maintaining soil fertility. William Fender is a researcher who has studied earthworms throughout the Pacific Northwest. Here he searches for native worms in a clear cut in the coast range of northern Oregon. What we're seeing is like the tip of an iceberg. Most of the world, most of the, the real action is small and hidden so that what's going on under our feet is as important or more important than anything we can see. Earthworms are a major part of that. The small size of earthworms belies their true significance. They contribute to soil fertility in several important ways, including the mixing of organic materials into the mineral soil to create nutrient-rich humus. Soil fertility depends very largely on not just the nutrients that are there, but their availability. Most plants aren't able to get their nutrients from, say, dead leaves and other material on the surface. It has to somehow get into the soil before they can actually use it. And earthworms do that. These were right next to each other. They're both right in the decaying organic material and the root mass right here. That's where they're, they're feeding. Earthworms also contribute to soil fertility through their tunneling practices. As they maneuver underground, they break up compacted soil and improve the circulation of air and water. Because of their great impact, earthworms have been called soil engineers. In one year, for example, the earthworms living in a single acre of land can move nearly 70 tons of earth. Over a period of time, in that top foot of soil, all of it goes through an earthworm's intestine. For all their importance, however, much is still unknown about earthworms. In the Pacific Northwest, for example, many native species have yet to be identified. That's the view of Dorothy McKee Fender, a longtime earthworm researcher and the mother of William Fender. In spite of all the advances that have been made, much remains to be done in a study of some of the simpler, humbler residents of this planet. Every time we, we go out on a, a collecting trip, we stand the chance of finding something that we've never seen before. While doing field work in the forests of Clearwater County in northern Idaho, the Fenders have had that experience not once, but on multiple occasions. There, in the soil beneath the veil of ferns that shades the forest floor, 
they've discovered three previously unidentified species of earthworms. Finding this group of species in Idaho was a big event, scientifically, and a big personal event. It's just like Christmas when you go out in a new place and find something new. <laughs> we live in a very, very rich world. There's so much that we don't know yet, so much variety. We're just scratching the surface here, and what we see, mostly, um, mostly it's still unknown. If earthworms play key roles in the maintenance of soil fertility, there are countless microorganisms that live and work underground that play equally vital roles. These microscopic species include bacteria and fungi, both of which provide critical support services to plants. With respect to nature's services, there's simply no other group of organisms that provides more important services than the microbial community. We get 99% of our food from soil, and we wouldn't get that if it weren't for the activity of the microbial community in soils. I want to collect six to 10 samples, about six inches or 15 centimeters deep. Mary Beth Watwood is a microbial ecologist who studies microscopic soil organisms. She points out that the wide range of services provided by microorganisms reflects their enormous biological diversity, as well as their great numbers. The human population just passed a level of about six billion people on Earth but you have that many microorganisms in one handful of soil. You can have six billion microorganisms in a single gram of soil. The diversity of microorganisms is incredible. It dwarfs the diversity in any other kinds of organisms on Earth. Billions and billions of microorganisms in a single handful of soil, and they're made of thousands and thousands of different species, most of which we haven't even begun to identify. In her years of research, Watwood has developed a deep appreciation for these microscopic organisms as the ultimate recyclers. One of the really important services that the microbial community provides is recycling. Microorganisms are the recyclers on the planet. During the course of their lifespans, plants and animals produce large amounts of all kinds of waste and if it weren't for the ability of microorganisms to convert those waste products again into usable nutrients, waste products would just accumulate to vast levels on the planet. So we really rely on microorganisms to be the ultimate recyclers, to be the ultimate trash collectors and converters of waste materials back to usable nutrients. In addition to recycling waste materials, Bacteria and fungi contribute to soil fertility by helping plants capture such essential nutrients as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. In the case of nitrogen, which is the basic building block of all proteins, plants are dependent on microorganisms for a steady supply. Without certain kinds of bacteria that have the ability to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it available to plants in a usable form, protein could not be formed, and neither plants nor animals could survive. One of the most common types of nitrogen-fixing bacteria is the rhizobium type. Rhizobium bacteria form very, very close associations with plants. Plants like legumes. Legumes include bean plants, alfalfa, lupins. There are a lot of leguminous plants. Rhizobium bacteria live in the soil. And when they come in contact with leguminous roots, they actually form structural changes in the plant called nodules. The rhizobia bacteria actually live in the nodules. And when they're in the nodules, they do little more than fix nitrogen. They basically become nitrogen fixing machines. Biological nitrogen fixation is extremely important in natural communities and in cultivated cropland. In cultivated croplands, there's some real advantages to a farmer to have this biological nitrogen fixation going on. One common practice that farmers undertake in order to avoid the high cost of chemical fertilizer is to use rotations of plants like alfalfa or soybeans 
that provide this kind of symbiotic nitrogen fixation. They'll rotate, for example, three years of alfalfa and then a year of corn and then perhaps another commodity crop after that. So the farmers don't have to add that much chemical fertilizer to their plots. One such farmer is Mike Nichols. Nichols employs this kind of crop rotation strategy on his farm in Parma, Idaho. By working with nature, we'll leave this alfalfa crop in for three years to build up the nitrogen. And then the nitrogen will be utilized by corn the following year which also helps in breaking down the root structure of the alfalfa. And then after the corn, we'll go to onions. And then after the onions, we go back to alfalfa seed again. Water, a delight to the senses, a sustainer of life, and one of the Earth's most precious resources. While it may seem that there is an unlimited supply of water on our ocean-covered planet, this vital resource is actually finite. And because there is a fixed quantity of water, it must be continually cleansed and recycled. That's why water purification is another of nature's most important services. Water filtration is an ongoing process in nature. In watersheds and in soils of all sorts, Microscopic organisms are constantly at work removing impurities from the water. A good place to observe this critical natural service in operation is in wetlands. Wetlands play a critical role in nature in terms of water purification. They can be compared with the liver and kidneys in the human body that clean the fluids as they flow through the body. Chris Hogue is a wetland plant ecologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. When he looks at a wetland, such as this one at the Camas National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Idaho, he sees an enormously effective natural filtration system. Wetlands are incredibly efficient in terms of removing contaminants from our water supply. They can remove a wide variety of different types of contaminants from excess nutrients to sediment to heavy metals to coliform bacteria. Many different kinds of wetland plants contribute to water purification. Among the most potent are the sedges. If wetland plants can be considered some of nature's unsung heroes, this is a perfect example. This is called a sedge. And sedges are, are a really neat plant because they have a tremendous root system. They have actually measured this root system to be 206 feet of roots per cubic inch of soil. And when you look at the root system, you can see how this looks like hair. It's so fine. And this provides a tremendous nursery site for, for small microbial populations that do a lot of the work in terms of removing excess nutrients from the water before it goes into either the groundwater or surface waters. Another important plant in wetland habitats is bulrush. Hardstem bulrush is actually called hardstem because the stems are very firm. And when the waves come through the bulrush stand, it can actually slow the velocity down, cause sediment to fall out and deposit on the bed, and then it protects the shoreline and, and riparian stream banks from erosion caused by the wave action. An important feature of wetland plants is that they can survive in standing water. The way they do this is the stems act as a straw to move oxygen from the atmosphere down in the root system. The root system is leaky and it provides oxygenated areas for microorganisms that live around the root systems to survive. The microorganisms are very important because it's not the plants that are actually filtering the water, it's the microorganisms that live on their root systems that are purifying the water. For all their importance in maintaining water quality, wetlands also provide critical wildlife habitat. In fact, wetlands are veritable oases of biodiversity. In addition to the water purification functions of a wetland, they provide critically important wildlife habitat to a wide variety of species. 
In fact, there are many birds, mammals, fish, insect life that thrive in wetlands. Wetlands provide food, cover, nesting platform, brood habitat, all the things that are necessary for a thriving population. So what we have here is an incredibly rich biological community that's made up of literally hundreds of different species. There are few species that play a more important role in retaining water for local use than the beaver. Through their dam building activities, beavers make important contributions to the formation of wetlands, meadows, and fertile valley bottoms. At this location, we can see where nature's engineer, the beaver, has helped to develop a broad range of habitat development and diversity within this stream system. Bruce Smith is a fisheries biologist and an authority on beavers. Here he surveys a beaver complex on the east fork of the Pissimeroi River in the Lost River Range of central Idaho. The upper dam above us here has most recently filled in with sediment and begun to wash out so that the water table in that dam is now starting to lower. And like the dam below us, we can see how a few years along, it will start to move into a wet meadow or a wetland kind of condition, creating a much more diverse habitat situation within the valley. In arid, high desert sites such as this one, beavers have been largely responsible for the formation of fertile meadows and valley bottoms. From this vantage point, we can see how beaver activity across the floodplain of the East Fork of the Pissimeroi River has created a ribbon of life within a high desert environment which receives very little precipitation throughout the year. We can see here how in these dams, over time, beaver have spread the flow of the stream across the width of the valley floor as well as moving the stream back and forth across the floodplain. And we see quite an extensive wetland water storage area here that helps to extend the runoff throughout the summer season. What we see here in microcosm is just one example of how across the length of entire streams, valley floors have been built throughout North America. Beaver dams trap sediment and prevent it from washing away. And this has a beneficial effect on soil fertility in the riparian areas where beavers live. Here we can see yet another way in which beaver enrich habitat by improving the productivity of soils. Here you can see the deep layer of organic humic type material that has been accumulated by the beaver pond, which as it gradually drains will become the new layer of topsoil in a future meadow. With beaver activity, we can see the formation of this type of rich, productive soil within only 10 or 20 years period of time. However, on upland environments, as we see in the sagebrush community, it may take thousands of years per inch of soil development. Because their dams slow water velocities and conserve moisture for local use, beavers also help maintain the health of watersheds. In a free-flowing stream, spring runoff typically comes down the watershed within a matter of weeks. As the temperature warms and the snow melts in the springtime, the runoff will pass on down the valley to the river bottoms in just a few weeks' time. In contrast with the activity of beaver in the headwater watersheds, that runoff is retarded so that it comes down over a period of months. If we look more closely at the natural processes that help maintain the health of watersheds, rivers, and streams, it's apparent that beavers are not working alone. Many other organisms and a whole array of biological mechanisms help control erosion and mitigate flooding. Nature manages water efficiently. When snow melts and rain falls on an intact watershed, it's broken up and it doesn't come off as one big surge. Instead, it comes off gradually because it's utilized by plants, it's dissipated by the leaves and needles and branches of the trees, and it soaks into the soil. 
so that when it reaches the stream, it's released slowly and the water doesn't flood and cause erosion. Wayne Minshall is a stream ecologist who studies the health of streams and watersheds throughout the Intermountain West. Here, in the Caribou National Forest in Idaho, he surveys a section of Goodenough Creek and the adjacent watershed. Here on this stretch of Goodenough Creek are a number of excellent examples of a healthy watershed and a healthy stream. One of the things we see right away is the well-vegetated banks and the fact that the plants are holding the soil and preventing it from entering the stream. In a healthy stream, one finds lots of organic debris. And it may be surprising to a number of people that this would be part of a healthy ecosystem. But in fact, this woody material, a variety of sorts of sizes and locations, provides a number of important services to the stream in the form of retaining leaves and other material and keeping it from being washed downstream, in providing a secure habitat, living place for organisms to feed and to hide from predators. In a location like this, one can see a variety of different kinds of habitats. This enhances the number of places where organisms can make a living and these organisms will be of a much greater diversity than would be found if this were a homogeneous environment. While too much sediment can choke streams and clog habitats used by aquatic insects and spawning fish, a certain amount of erosion is actually normal and healthy. Over time, rocks, gravels, and sediments are slowly released into the stream through natural processes of erosion, and they play an important role in maintaining the health of the stream bed. When this material erodes, it provides fine gravels and other small sediments to the stream, which provides important spawning habitat for trout and living paces for the aquatic insects, which are important food resources for the trout. For Wayne Minshall, the presence of aquatic insects is a critical measure of stream quality. The greater the number and diversity of insects present, the healthier the stream and the more fish it can support. In the gravel and larger rocks of a natural stream, there are a variety of aquatic insects. These gravels and other large rocks provide important habitat for aquatic insects, such as this mayfly, this herbivorous stonefly, and this carnivorous stonefly. This mayfly is a grazing insect, and all these together provide important food resources for trout and other fish. These dragonflies are important players in another of nature's life support services the regulation of population and disease. Dragonflies are predators, and in marshy areas like this, they consume large numbers of mosquitoes, thus helping control mosquito populations. But that's only part of the story, because in nature's system of checks and balances, the dragonfly population is itself subject to control. Frogs, fish, snakes, and other predators limit the number of dragonflies by feeding on their larvae. As species act to limit one another's populations, a dynamic balance is maintained in natural communities. A particularly dramatic example of population control took place here in the Four Corners region of the American Southwest. This was ground zero the epicenter of a viral outbreak that once captured the attention of the nation. It was here that a major outbreak of the deadly hantavirus occurred in 1993. The hantavirus outbreak was triggered by heavy rains, brought on by an El Nino weather pattern. Nature is very dynamic and there are long periods of fairly normal conditions punctuated by extremes. And one of those particular extremes was the El Nino of 1992. 
in the winter spring period of that time we had ex extraordinarily wet conditions. Uh, this looks like a perignatus flavescence. Robert Parmenter is a community ecologist and director of the University of New Mexico's Sevieta Long-Term Ecological Research Station near Socorro, New Mexico. He recalls that the heavy rains of 1992 had a great impact on plant and animal populations in the southwest. So all sorts of different plant species were growing. The flowers were incredible. And with that increase in plants, we get an increase of insects, grasshoppers, beetles, crickets, all these sorts of things. So that the food levels for rodents started to increase through the summer of 1992. And because the reproduction of these rodents is very great and the food was abundant, the rodent population started to expand. Deer mice were among the species that experienced a dramatic spike in population. These small nocturnal animals, while seemingly harmless, can be carriers of deadly hantaviruses. What's more, deer mice often live in areas populated by humans. Because of these two factors, their population explosion had a direct impact on human communities, especially those in the Four Corners area of the Southwest. With greatly elevated numbers of mice, human exposure to the virus was also elevated. And in fact, many human infections were reported, some of which resulted in death. It wasn't long, however, before natural mechanisms of population control came into play to check the boom. As the mouse population is increasing, the mice clearly are becoming more abundant and it makes an easier target for the predators. The different species that would prey on rodents would include snakes, coyotes, foxes, weasels, owls, and hawks sometimes if they can catch them during the daytime. These animals would start to learn very quickly that these abundant mice are easy targets and they would zero in on them. As the rodent population declines due to the pressure from these predators, of course the mice become harder to find and they're harder to catch. And so these predators would start switching to other prey. And that is why predators cannot wipe out their prey population. Because these mice carry all these terrible diseases, one might think that they are absolutely worthless in nature. However, the mice are part of nature and they participate in the natural checks and balances that occur. Deer mice control beetle populations, grasshopper populations, so they form a function in nature of keeping other species in balance. If population control is a natural service of immediate benefit to humans, there is another type of service, genetic diversity, whose importance extends into the furthest reaches of the future. Genetic diversity represents a biological bank account, an account that contains an astronomical number of individual genes. This bank account plays a critical role in medical research, especially in the development of new medicines. Of the top 150 prescription drugs in the United States, for example, 118 are from natural sources. Oh, here's a good piece. Scientists regularly study plant materials for their disease-fighting potentials. One of the most important discoveries in recent years was taxol, a complex molecule found in the Pacific U, a tree that grows widely throughout the Pacific Northwest. Since being discovered by researchers at the National Cancer Institute, Taxol has been found to be a powerful tool in combating a variety of cancers, including breast, ovarian, and lung cancer. I had a locally advanced breast cancer, which meant that it was moving into many of the nodes under my arm. For Nancy Randall, a resident of Clarkston, Washington, Taxol proved effective in halting the spread of the cancer that threatened her life. A couple of days ago, I saw the yew tree for the first time since I have gotten better, and it brought me to tears. It still does. I have an awful lot of 
gratitude for this little tree and for the, the researchers out there that have done the research over the years. And, and I would like to thank each and every one of them. Since being treated with Taxol, Nancy Randall has gained a new appreciation for the value of medicines derived from plants. Taxol's been in the news a lot over the last few years, but there are a number of other drugs that come from plant sources. Also, one of the ones is aspirin, very common. It comes from the willow bark. I feel that because biomedical research is, is still a relatively new field, there is so much that we still have to learn. We've barely touched the surface. In Nancy Randall's view, the story of the Pacific U provides an important cautionary tale. To her, it shows how the value we place on particular species can change over time. And it also reveals the importance of respecting and preserving biological diversity. I think it's interesting that as a child, when clear-cut logging was the norm, that the little Pacific U was considered a, a waste tree. And today, we know that the Pacific U is incredibly important, and it's probably one of the most well-known drug stories of recent years. And there are so many people walking around alive because of that little tree. Genetic diversity is just as valuable in agriculture as it is in medicine. It provides plant and animal species with a range of attributes that help them adapt to changing conditions. In Idaho and other potato growing states, for example, potato breeders can select particular traits out of the genetic bank account created by some 250 species of potatoes growing in the wild. Humans have been doing selective breeding for thousands of years. All of our crops, domestic animals, have originated from wild species, and humans have chosen the best individuals to breed. And that is what we're doing here, following in, in the tradition. For many years, Joseph Pavek has served as the chief potato breeder for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the Pacific Northwest. During his long career, he has bred many varieties of potatoes, including the popular Ranger Russet. Pavek is interested in the genetic diversity found in wild potato populations. And that interest has brought him to Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Oh yes, there they are. Let's go down and take a look. He and other scientists are looking among the ruins of ancient Anasazi Indian settlements for wild potatoes. This is a great small population. Of Their the, purpose of this, is to collect uh, genetic here. material and add it to the collection of the U.S. Potato Gene here. Bank in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. The wild potatoes we're collecting here may be useful to me as a breeder for developing varieties that will help the farmers stay ahead of diseases and pests. The stakes for potato breeders, like Joseph Pavek, are very high especially in light of disasters like the Irish potato famine of the 1840s. At that time, there was little genetic variety among the potatoes being grown in Ireland, and a disease known as late blight spread rapidly across the island nation, wiping out most of the crop. This was very devastating in Ireland because the population was so dependent on the potato and the potatoes rotted in the ground. And the history books say that Somewhere around two million people died or emigrated as a result of that catastrophe. If there had been resistant varieties available at the time, it probably would not have had nearly the effect. And the goal of a modern breeder is to never let this happen again. And so we're attempting to anticipate possible problems and we're breeding new varieties that, that will have resistance to these possible diseases. We've got a population here, looks like it's thousands of plants, and uh, the Park Service has given us permission here today to get 10 tubers or sample from 10 plants among this population. Nowadays, people are accustomed to larger potatoes, but until the Europeans came to North America, the Native Americans 
had nothing larger than these that we have dug today. What's interesting is that we can hybridize these using special techniques with our cultivated potato and we will get out the large size that we need. One important thing that I can see is that these have the ability to survive under stressful conditions. Lack of rain, hot conditions and so on, and then overabundance of rain and cold temperatures. So they are adapted to stressful conditions. And that is something that we need in our modern cultivars is adaptation to stressful conditions. The genetic characteristics of wild potatoes growing in New Mexico are of interest to potato breeders around the world. Among the researchers taking part in the Chaco Canyon expedition are John Bamberg, the head of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Potato Gene Bank in Wisconsin, and Stepan Kiru, a potato geneticist from the Nikolai Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. We have good joint projects with all gene banks, American gene banks, South American gene banks, and European gene banks. This collaboration is very important for all uh, breeders in the world and, of course, for all farmers in the world. All the collecting that we do is really an international undertaking these days, whether in Latin America or here or anywhere. It's going to involve the country uh, of origin, of course, and then almost always it's a, an international team that will go there and collect that germplasm. The genetic materials gathered from wild potato populations are studied in research facilities around the world, including this agricultural research station in Aberdeen, Idaho. Here, scientists are crossbreeding wild tubers with commercial varieties to produce potatoes that are more resistant to diseases and pests. People may wonder how we go about creating new varieties. And we, in fact, follow nature's method. In nature, the bees carry pollen from plant to plant. And we, as breeders of new potato varieties, carry pollen from plant to plant, too. But the big difference between us and the bees is that the bees do it at random, and we do it most selectively. <laughs> While scientists are busy using genetic diversity to help ensure a reliable food supply, there's another kind of natural benefit that's being enjoyed by large numbers of people throughout the Intermountain West, and indeed, around the world. It is the deep personal enjoyment that we derive from our relationship with nature. Every year, Millions of people turn to nature for fun and adventure, for recreation and relaxation, and for inspiration, reflection, and personal enrichment. These activities are a source of profound meaning and enjoyment in our lives, and their value defies material calculation. For many of us, these gifts from the natural world are the ones we appreciate most consciously and they are also the ones through which we experience our deepest connections with the earth. Throughout this program, we have looked at some of the critical services provided by healthy natural systems. Although we've examined these services in the context of Idaho and the American West, they are in fact universal and can be found in all parts of the world. Collectively, they represent a global life support system. Bees and microorganisms, bulrush and sedge, dragonflies and rattlesnakes, all play important roles in maintaining the services on which human life depends. As we have seen, the human economy is fully dependent on nature's services. If we want to safeguard the health of our economy, it is essential for us to conserve the underlying natural systems that support it. And if we want to ensure the availability of nature's services for future generations, we need to become wise and conscientious stewards in our own time. To purchase a copy of this program, call Idaho Public Television toll-free 
at 877-224-7200. The cost is $19.95 for this program and $49.95 for the full three-part series. For more information about biological diversity and educational materials available through the Natural Heritage Center, please visit the website below. Funding for Treasuring Our Natural Heritage has been provided by the National Science Foundation. A presentation of the Natural Heritage Center and Idaho Public Television.